Thanks to everyone who helped organize. Thanks for the introduction, Bruce. Very kind words. Appreciate that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and welcome to Ames. Um, unfortunately, there's a dark cloud in the east. This sounds like J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> the dark cloud is coming from the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> in case you haven't heard, the much beloved basketball coach at Iowa State appears to be in danger of leaving. <laughs> so there's going to be an announcement tomorrow, likely, by the sound of it. And uh, unfortunately, that may be bad news. So if you see the locals, you know, kind of scuffling along tomorrow, that's likely going to be the reason. So uh, I want to be uplifting today, <laughs> especially to those <laughs> Iowa State people. Yeah, yeah, it'll be OK. We'll get through this. And. Um, Seriously, about agroforestry is we think of ourselves often as on the fringe. And what I want to try and convince everyone is th there are opportunities in the future that I see agroforestry going mainstream. And I know we've say that, we say that a lot, but it's happened before. And that's what I want to talk about today is some of the circumstances, some of the background of how that happened and why we may see that opportunity arise again. And it's all about agroforestry and climate change. This um, uh, image on the right is a poster from the Prairie States, Prairie, <laughs> no, Prairie States Forestry Project uh, from the Dust Bowl days. Um, in those days, they uh, were trying to create work for people, including artists. And in this case, they had artists make posters to promote their other programs. And so this is an example of that uh, artwork. And it says, uh, plains farms need trees. Trees prevent wind erosion, save moisture, protect crops. And I like this part, contribute to human comfort and happiness. <laughs> so you know, I don't think uh, we can capture agroforestry's, uh, that, you know, that's our goal right there, right? Human comfort and happiness, that's about productivity, um, uh, local food sourcing. Uh, climate change effects, mitigation, adaptation. We can capture all of that under comfort and happiness. So let's, let's work with that theme. Climate change, you know, I, uh, I've been working pretty heavily in this area for some years, kind of contentious. Sometimes I try to give a talk without saying the dreaded CC, climate change, because it can polarize your audience. Um, the point is, Almost all of these items on this slide, you can make a pretty good argument for. It's not clear cut. It may never be clear cut. The only one I would uh, say that you cannot make an argument for is climate is not changing. Anyone know what the climate was like here 14,000 years ago? Any ideas? Oh, pretty cold. Pretty, pretty cold. cold, yeah, because we were under about a half a mile of ice. <laughs> so uh, climate's always changing. That shouldn't be part of the debate. So uh, the question really is, what are the drivers? Is it good or bad? We should be concerned about it or not. Um, and you can argue back and forth. But I think we have to accept both sides of the argument, because it's not definitive. And so to just dismiss the other side um, is not really a, um, effective or going to lead to progress. We have to accept that it's not definitive. And we need to decide on ourselves, by ourselves, what we want to pursue, how we want to pursue it, what the priorities are for us. Whether we drag others along with us, you know, this is one of those issues that that's not, that's not the way it's going to work, I'm afraid. So here's the story. Uh, the the uh, upper graph is uh, about food. We're going to need more calories in the next 50 years than humans consumed in the last 500. So that's a pretty daunting challenge for agriculture. We need to produce a lot more food. We already have about 15% of the population that's food insecure. So it's not like we're feeding everyone now. And I know it's a complicated issue. It's not all about supply. It's about distribution. It's about waste. It's about social inequities. Um, we also have, in the United States, these bioenergy goals, where we want to not only produce food, but we want to produce uh, biofuels. And so there are competing issues, competing 
um, polls on what we want to produce from our land. So there's a couple of terms that, that I go back to often in my own thinking and that you're going to see a lot more of in the future. The first one, sustainable intensification. This is a term from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And I think that captures one of the challenges right there, is that we can talk about increasing productivity, but if that increased productivity further declines our resource base, that's not the way to the future. We already have compromised soil, water, air resources. We can't continue to do that. And if we're going to intensify production and accelerate those, that degradation, that's not the path forward. The other is the land equivalent ratio, which I think really fits nicely with agroforestry. It gets away from the idea of the, you know, the monoculture, monocropping idea. We need to look for ways to get more perennials in the landscape, more intercropping, more um, uh, um, crop rotation, anything we can do to get more productivity out of the land in a sustainable way, more out of the same land area because we have limited area. And so the land equivalent ratio gets back to how much more can we produce on the same parcel of land at the same time. You know, there are people who will say, people like, people like me are the chicken littles, right? Why worry about the future? Look at those productivity of corn. Holy buckets, yield is going up. It's going, who knows where that's going to end, right? Um, but if you've had any amount of biology, how many sort of infinite linear curves do you see in growth? Um, not so many, right? So it's going to end someday. Those curves are going to flatten out. And that's part of the problem, right? It's like, where are they going to flatten out? The other part of the problem is you have nagging little things like droughts. And you can say, well, it's a statistical outlier. Well, it's not a statistical outlier if you're in California, uh, where you've got, you know, people are now talking the mega drought, the century-long drought. Well, that's going to change your perspective on food production uh, in a hurry. And so, we, in a highly uh, mechanized, productive system like we have in the U.S., we don't like to think about our vulnerabilities. We are extremely vulnerable to climate. Droughts and floods, absolutely. Um, we don't like to think about it that way, but we are. And those anomalies, those uh, extreme events, if they indeed become more frequent, they're going to become more costly to us in terms of productivity. So it's not so much about the averages as the extremes. Just in the last few years in, ha in Ames here, um, the 2010 flood, if you drive up University Boulevard, 14 feet of water in the basketball arena. Coach Hoiberg would not have been happy uh, that day. Um, that was, I think, the third 500-year flood in the last 25 years. So we might have to start redoing some statistics there. The two years later, we have the worst drought that I can remember in my lifetime. Uh, I saw wetlands uh, without water in them that I had never seen in my lifetime. Um, so it was dry. It was a severe drought uh, two years after a flood, another flood, the third flood of the 500-year uh, type. Of course, these all have consequences for our productivity. Throw in this, um, a little bit of misinformation occasionally. I, I really um, believe it does not help when you have the New York Times saying, considering all the interactions, large-scale increases in forest cover can actually make global warming worse. This is not helpful. <laughs> there is a lot of information out there, and I'll soon be talking about the Climate Hub, and I think sometimes that the Climate Hub is the filter. You got to get the noise out of the picture. People are really frustrated because they hear so many different things. And a lot of it is almost hysterical about this or that, the crises, the impending doom. And I think people just tone it out, saying, well, there's so much, I don't know what to believe. I just tone it out. It is, you know, you know the rebuttals on this were, were brilliant. Um, 
I don't know what the New York Times was thinking <laughs> putting out an, an, an article like this. But anyway, that's just one example. So here we are, the Midwest uh, Climate Hub, located here in Ames, Iowa. It's a virtual hub. There's no building. It exists in our office, in our minds, on computers somewhere. Um, it's really the idea of Secretary Vilsack. Um, so it's one of those top-down led ideas. And it's all about uh, providing the integration of information. Taking information from stakeholders is going up, from researchers coming down, assimilating that, trying to prioritize things, filter, and facilitate that exchange of information. A key element here is that letter E right there, or the OCE. Um, that stands for the Office of the Chief Economist of USDA. And so that's the home for the climate hubs. They're all led by either by ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, or the Forest Service. And in our case, for the Midwest Hub, we have a sub-hub in Houghton. So we have both uh, leadership from ARS and the Forest Service in the Midwest, for the Midwest Hub. The Office of the Chief Economist. So what do you think the Office of the Chief Economist is interested in about climate change? This map, I think, is a, a fairly good illustration of what they're interested in. Let's just think about what's happening in Texas right now. What is the impact of all that flooding going to be on ag production this year? It's an immense loss of productivity. So the chief economist's office is kind of interested in that and either reducing the risk or in some way adapting to the new realities of what those risks are for loss in productivity. That's the driver behind the climate hub. <clears throat> so here's the conceptual framework. And again, um, there's a lot of arrows there. We have partners, federal, USDA, NEFA, the experiment station, and the um, all omnipresent many others. And this is not an exclusive club. Um, I think the, cl the climate hubs all have their own sort of different uh, culture, but they all have different partners and lots of them, and that's a good thing. We want to be integrative of different ideas, input from lots of different directions. Comes into the hub, and then, um, you know, I really believe these arrows should be pointing both ways, because that's, that's the idea of how it's going to work. We have these tech transfer pro providers, extension service centers, Forest Service Threat Centers, and others again, and then our stakeholders down here. Information and tools flowing this way, questions and feedback flowing that way. That's the, that's the model of how the hubs are going to work. They're very new, uh, just a little over a year old, so they're still evolving. Um, but I think this is still a fairly accurate depiction of what the goals are for, the overall goals are for the climate hubs. There's a picture of the uh, screenshot of the uh, Midwest Climate Hub webpage and the address is down here. Um, a lot of the uh, activities so far has been preparing information. And so there's still a lot of coordinating behind the scenes about what kind of information, how to make it cohesive between hubs, what the different needs of the different hubs are, et cetera. Uh, so it's an evolving, evolving uh, presence on the, on the internet largely so far. And we, we have prepared uh, a fact sheet. This is the, the one for the Midwest uh, Climate Hub. There are other fact sheets for the different hubs. I think every hub has at least one fact sheet available out there on the, on the internet now. And you know this first one is talking about climate risks in the Midwest and what those risks to productivity are. Well, getting back to climate change effects, um, they're not all bad, right? Um, my colleagues in Russia think warming in Siberia is kind of a good thing. Um, and it will perhaps enhance some of their productivity, but there's always a downside. Uh, warming, is there going to be the uh, loss of synchronization between pollinators and when plants are flowering? If these changes happen too quickly, the plants, animal, insect communities can't adapt fast enough, 
And so, um, you know, the, it's not all good. Um, but it's not all bad either. Uh, so, you know, I don't like to paint the doom and gloom of climate change. Uh, there are, in reality, there are going to be some, some that are going to be winners. That this is okay for them. Uh, unfortunately, it appears as though there's going to be a lot more that it's going to be a problem. Like, um, I can't advance. There we go. Oh. Oh. So it's, it gets back to the extreme events again. The heavy, very heavy pre precipitation. Now, if anyone here is from Texas, what's it been like? I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I used to go out to check the gauge. Yeah, you know, quarter of an inch. All right. And the last two weeks, about well, for last month. Three and a half inches in one one night. Well, the ground's you know in some of those areas you know it's kind of a clay loam. So once it's saturated, all the water runs out. Yeah. So you know you, you don't put a lot of water into the soil. And unfortunately, I would say in two weeks from now we'll start the high pressures in the, uh, in the central part of the country, and we'll be. 95 to 100 degrees and lose most of that moisture. Yeah. I heard yesterday for 23 straight days, one location in Texas has got at least four inches of rain that day for 23 consecutive days. Yeah, we had more rain in May this year than we had the entire year last year. So the drought's over. <laughs> no, the drought's not over. <laughs> well, they filled all the lakes. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not only about amounts, it's also about distribution. And one of the interesting things about this is that look at summertime rainfall, Midwest, Pacific uh, Northwest. This is predicted lower pre amounts of precipitation. So growing season precipitation in these models is predicted to be less. It's not encouraging to people who don't like winter that you're going to get more in precipitation in the winter. And it's not helpful to growers if they cannot store that moisture for when the crops need it. So if we're having hotter, drier summers in the Midwest, Pacific Northwest, it's going to have consequences for productivity. And it is all about water. I, I, used, I can say sometimes all about water and all about carbon, but it's really all about carbon and water. Plants need water to grow. And we've known for about a century that it's, that is a linear relationship. More water that you pump through a plant, the more it grows, the greater the yield. And so this water use efficiency uh, for corn over here, different curves for different locations. In Iowa, you get 10 bushels of corn for every inch of ET. Right now, it's about 200 bushels. Average yield in this area, so that's 20 inches of ET out of the 34 inches of precipitation that we get. A lot of people talk about 300 bushel corn. How much ET is that going to take? 30 inches. 34 inches of rainfall? Ooh, you're going to have to be careful with that water. So um, yeah, it's a, it is about water. If we're going to really increase yields, we have to be very careful with water use in rain-fed agriculture. I like this. this uh, paper by Ermach et al. about soybean where they didn't measure ET, they just measured how much plant available soil water was in the root zone and they can predict yield for soybean. So you just need to know how much water is available and you can predict the yield. That's intimate information that we haven't thought about before because we've always relied on rain-fed agriculture and our yields were low enough that the water use wasn't limiting factor. You start pushing 300 bushel corn, water will be a limiting factor, even in rain-fed agriculture in Iowa. So how do we get more water? We have to store more water. We have to store it in the root zone. Unfortunately, we've eroded a lot of our topsoils. 
We've destroyed structure. We've lost organic matter. Our soils do not hold as much water as they used to. And it's largely because of the loss of soil organic matter. This paper by Hudson, very, very interesting read. All he said was, look, if you have changing organic matter, it changes your permanent wilting point. The permanent wilting point for the soil increases. What really happens is the field capacity increases much more. So this shaded area between those two curves, that's the plant available water. And as you've eroded your soil and lost organic matter, you've gone this direction. What you need to do is rebuild that soil organic matter and go this direction, and you get a dramatic increase in plant available water, the amount of water that you can store in the soil profile. If the organic matter increases from 1% to 4.5%, your water, available water content doubles. So this is the strategy for the future in rain-fed agriculture, is we've got to turn around this loss of soil organic matter, rebuild it into the soil, and the justification, amongst others, for doing that is to increase our plant available water. Soil Organic Matter has its own uh, publication uh, put out by UNEP uh, talking about all the services provided by Soil Organic Matter. It's an interesting publication and um, doesn't really talk about carbon sequestration per se. This is, these are all the benefits of Soil Organic Matter if you're not even thinking about climate change and or carbon sequestration. And in fact, it may have been a disservice to put so much attention on carbon sequestration because it, it sort of distracted people from all the benefits of organic matter in soil productivity. So we need to build more resilient cropping systems. And there's lots of different ways to do that. I'm going to focus on agroforestry today, of course. But there are many other things that, that we can do in agriculture to help improve productivity make us more resilient to climate change effects. And so we'll focus the rest of the presentation here about agroforestry. And I'm assuming this is a fairly uh, savvy agroforestry crowd, so uh, we won't go through all of the uh, sort of introductory remarks, but I'll try to broaden it. I'm focusing on largely on tree windbreaks in the Great Plains today, but try and keep my comments a little broader focused as well. Um, trees and climate. One of the interesting things that we um, don't often appreciate is that farmers, as they move west, um, were stymied by prairie because they'd only been used to clearing forests to grow crops. And so prairie, they thought, was not fertile, didn't have trees, must not be able to grow crops. And so as they move farther west, that kind of caught them by surprise. It's like, ooh, prairie, mm, I guess we can't farm here. So until they, got, they invented the moldboard plow, the steel uh, John Deere moldboard plow, and decided that indeed you could grow crops in prairie, they sort of stopped moving west for a generation. Uh, Sterling Morton, he and so there was this big push to plant trees. And Sterling Morton, founder of Arbor Day, uh, has this quote about economic feasibility, the psychological benefits, aesthetic qualities, and the morality of tree planting. So they, the idea was that in order to get the settlers to go west, you're going to have to plant trees in the plains, because that's what's going to bring them west. Um, climate change was a big factor in this as well, because when they had wet years, the uh, settlers would relent and start moving west. They had dry years. That really put them off. So some of this. Uh, westward expansion was related to uh, cycles in rainfall. And then we have the Dust Bowl. And I, I, I really like the Dust Bowl example. Not that it was that great of a time for anybody, but um, it shows what we can do under an extreme and an urgent climate-driven stress on our system. So um, you know, it affected a large area of the Great Plains Really, uh, the panhandles of Texas, Oklahoma, 
in Kansas were the epicenter, the worst part of the Dust Bowl affected um, areas. And what had happened is there had been years of above average rainfall. The settlers went in, farmers uh, broke the sod, the native prairie, planted wheat, got a few good harvests, but it left the soil bare. And then the drought came and they had winds and they had these horrific windstorms and uh, wind erosion. That um, the founder of the Soil Conservation Service delayed his testimony in front of Congress uh, for the dust cloud to reach Washington. And uh, so he gave his, um, his testimony in front of Congress, I think when the street lights were on in Washington in the middle of the day, because there was a dust cloud from the Great Plains there. So um, he got their attention. Uh, so it was a severe, severe event. Well, one of the responses uh, came from the Forest Service. Uh, the Forest Service had the attention of the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so he gave them the task of preparing a feasibility analysis for a uh, afforestation project to help relieve the Dust Bowl conditions. That resulted in this publication, Possibilities of Shelter Belt Planting in the Plains Region where it says, it's the subtitle, A Study of Tree Planting for Protective and Ameliorative Purposes. And so what the plan was, is they were going to put a series of windbreaks throughout this so-called shelter pelt zone, cutting through the Great Plains. And they had a lot of different plans, and we'll talk about the one they settled on, but the idea was that they were going to plant trees in these areas where they had the uh, resources to think that the trees would survive, because they didn't want them to, to die, of course, and that this was going to pro provide protection to that erosive cropland. It's an excellent feasibility study. It covered all aspects that you could uh, imagine, uh, social aspects, groundwater, soils, uh, local sources of seed for the trees to plant. It was very comprehensive very well prepared and quickly repaired, prepared. So in the eight years of the project, starting in 1935, uh, the shelter belt zone, by the way, was 1,150 miles by 100 miles wide. They, f they estimated that 56% of it was suitable for tree planting. And in those eight years, they planted 217 million trees largely by hand. Um, that uh, worked out to be 18,600 miles, or 238,000 acres of windbreaks. It was a very, very large project. Uh, the flow chart of the organization is a wonderful thing. If I could have scanned it and got it on a uh, slide, it would be very interesting because how it broke down in regions, how they assigned uh, different groups. They kept meticulous records of all the activities. Um, and they did this all in a really brief amount of time uh, during Depression era conditions where funding was limited. And one of the other interesting things about this project was one of the hugely controversial things was the federal government was working on land it did not own. It was one of the very first times the federal government had a project where they were providing assistance on land that they did not own. And that was hugely controversial politically for the project. In 1954, Reed did a uh, survey of the existing plantings, and this was published in 58. And he found that 73% were in fair to excellent condition. And to our knowledge, there's never been any sort of assessment since that uh, 1954 assessment on these plantings. It was literally the president's idea. He uh, talked about it on a uh, campaign stop. He was accustomed to planting trees at his Hyde Park estate. And he said, well, this is what they need to do in the Great Plains. So he actually announced it aboard a ship uh, in July of 1934. The Forest Service quickly put together that possibilities document. So you can imagine they put together that document between July of 34 and March of 35. For what purpose? Congress. This was going to be their sales pitch to Congress to fund it. They made a tactical error. They put Roosevelt's picture 
in the document. Um, if you can believe it, there was partisan politics involved. <laughs> and immediately, everyone who disliked FDR and his policies focused on this project. So um, one of them may have been Lloyd Thurston, a representative from Iowa, who didn't wholeheartedly support the Shelter Belt Project. Um, one of the key proponents, however, was a congressman from Georgia who uh, got no benefit from the project that I, could, um, that I can see. Um, so anyway, it was, a, it was a, a bitter struggle to get funding and to keep funding for this project. The key players were Bates and Zahn, the scientists. Um, they wrote the possibilities report. Bates was really the, the, the expert, the silviculturalist expert. Zahn, he was a proponent. He was the salesman, really. Paul Roberts, he was the administrator. He was the enabler. He ran the interference. And Secretary of Agriculture, there's another Iowa connection. Henry Wallace from Iowa was the Secretary of Agriculture. And apparently, it was not uncommon for FDR, when he saw Wallace at a cabinet meeting or other meeting, to say, hey, Wallace, how are my trees? Now, if you're Secretary of Agriculture, and the President's asking you a question like that, my guess is this project had his attention. Um, he was probably paying pretty close attention to how his trees were doing. They kept meticulous records. I want to thank uh, Dave James from our lab and Rich Carmen from the Forest Service in Lincoln. Um, they work together and they have this map. These uh, sort of blurry areas are the original maps of the planting of some of these windbreaks. They delineated those uh, original plantings with a sharp line, and here's where they are today. I think that's an image from 2010 or 2012. So tell me, how many conservation practices do we know that 80 years later, they're still there, and you can still see the benefits. Do we know many other conservation practices the government's put on the land that we can say that about? They're not all there. Some of them are gone. But a lot of them are still there. And I'm really hopeful that we can continue collecting this kind of information because it shows the impact of that project 80 years ago. And there are other ones that are that weren't part of the project that are there now. So there's new ones as well. That suggests that they thought they worked, that there was a benefit. And so even after the project ended, people continued following that practice. And why did they choose windbreaks? It was all about climate. It was all about controlling microclimate, changing the local microclimate, uh, protecting the crops. And that was by reducing wind capturing snow in the winter. There are multiple effects. And these are not unique to windbreaks, because that's what most agroforestry practices are about, are about modifying the local climate. And this is particularly true in the drier, semi-arid type conditions, where the windbreaks really made a difference in improving crop growth. There have been various reviews and, and um, what the, imp the impact on crop productivity is, and that uh, generally it comes out to about a field average 15% increase in yield. Interestingly enough, uh, the Russians, the Russian literature, uh, comes out to almost exactly the same number. Different crops, different climate, uh, same number. Raphael Zahn was a big proponent of planting trees to increase rainfall. He published this uh, report in 1927 where he said that uh, forests increased both the abundance and frequency of precipitation up to 25%. The problem was is that they put a lot of this into that possibilities document, that if we plant trees, it not only will protect the crops, but it'll bring the rain back. And boy, did that stir up a hornet's nest of um, opposition. Uh, the Society of American Foresters uh, almost formally condemned the project. The president of the society had scathing editorials saying that it was a bad idea. The trees would not grow, and they wouldn't make a difference. That's me standing in Kamenaya Steppe, Russia, in a 110-year-old windbreak in a place that gets about 20 inches of annual precipitation. It's a forest. Uh, I don't know, the Russians don't question this. They believe that 
putting forests back on the land will affect rainfall. If you do enough of it, um, and they have done a lot. There are also a couple of big afforestation projects out there, one in China, one in Africa. Uh, the Great Green Wall is the, the one in Africa. Uh, I like the quote from Van Dyke and Keenan, the historically popular assumption that forests generate rainfall may have been dismissed too readily by science. It's interesting now that it was condemned for a long time, and people have always believed that deforestation leads to lower rainfall, but have never been able to go the other way, that afforestation would increase rainfall. And the argument has always been it's about scale. Um, well, apparently, if you plant big enough, uh, you can address that scale question as well, and the models are showing the same result. Raphael Zahn was a Russian. He was a classmate of Lenin, and he knew about the work in Russia, and he brought that information with him to the United States. And here's an example of one of the early plans. They were going to plant in that shelter belt zone, they were going to plant a windbreak every mile for all 1,150 miles from Texas to Canada, across the 100 mile wide belt. So he was born in Zimbursk. He knew. Dukachev's work at Kamenaya Steppe. I'm not sure if he had ever been there, but he knew of the work. Dukachev was the all-star of Russian science. How many here are soil scientists? Who's Dukachev? Father of soil science. Exactly. Give that man a prize. <laughs> He's the father of soil science, the founder of soil science. They had a famine in 1891. The imperial government sent their best man to Kamenaya Steppe, Dukachayev. And his, his goal, his task, simple, stop the droughts. So he led a team there, and one of the very first activities they were involved with, planting trees. Because they believed, like others, that this area which had lost forest cover, if they could restore some of that forest cover, would alleviate the droughts. There are many other factors involved, but it basically was all about capturing and storing water. They had these hot, dry winds, Sokovis, the thirsty winds that came in, could desiccate and kill a crop in two or three days. The trees protected the crops from those winds, and uh, Dukachayev even went farther than that in putting trees in the landscape, and it was all about water. It was all about water. Yep, conserving moisture, capturing snow, physical protection from the Sokovis. He had riparian plantings. They planted 320,000 acres by 1900. So once they had collected this information, built the justification, they went full throttle into tree planting. Even Comrade Stalin liked the idea. Uh, and we will defeat the drought. He had a l much larger plan in mind that uh, his death interrupted. Um, but basically, they were going to plant at a massive scale. And it was all about ending the droughts in the steppes of Russia. And they're there today, trees everywhere. We drove from six hour, for six hours from Belgorod to Kamenaya Steppe, virtually never out of sight of a tree windbreak the entire time. And even this is a practice that has survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. Even as the collective farms uh, disappeared, they keep on planting trees. They believe in this practice. Um, we had a grant. I'm going to talk about this this afternoon in a, in a topical session uh, with Yuri Chendev at uh, Belgorod State University. And it was about carbon sequestration in the soils. Uh, Rick Hall here at Iowa State was helping us with the tree component. And then we were going to scale that up with uh, Comet Farm. We did some field work in 2012 and 2013. We had three sites in the Great Plains. One of these in Norfolk was a Prairie States Forestry Project site. Three sites in Russia. And then we came back in 2013 and did three more sites um, in the unglaciated area, unglaciated area of the Upper Great Plains. These sites gave us a range of mean annual temperature, precipitation, and this hydrothermal coefficient, which is a climate index. 
uh, for that we could compare the sites. Bottom line is that in all of these locations, we tended to get greater soil organic car carbon beneath the tree plantings, regardless of soil, tree species, and length of time since afforestation. On average, it was an 18.5% increase across these tree plantings. Oops. What was interesting about it, and I think one of the most interesting uh, results of the study, is that uh, the Russian sites and the American sites both lined up on this curve rather nicely. The hydrothermal coefficient, warm and dry, cool and moist. On the y-axis, this is the difference in the depth of the organic rich horizon under the trees and in the native grassland, the difference between the two. So if it's a positive number, the trees are actually increasing the depth of the organic horizon. So what we're seeing here is that there's a breakoff point here below a hydrothermal coefficient of about 1.1 where planting trees, they're actually losing carbon in these hotter, drier climates. But the warmer and moister we get, or sorry, the cooler and moister we get, we're increasing the depth of the organic rich horizon in the soil in both Russia and the United States. We have more work planned for the summer to continue uh, to look at this relationship tried tying climate to this change in organic matter in the soil. Um, we'd like to expand this to a regional scale, so the uh, Comet Farm is helping us do this, but we took the uh, National Commodity Crop Productivity Index, which is a way to take soil properties to estimate how productive the soil will be, soil survey data, land cap capability classification from the soil survey, and then the NAS crop data layers to identify marginal soils because we don't want to compete with highly productive, highly productive land. Uh, we uh, want to re help rehabilitate marginal lands and protect, protect those pro most productive lands with windbreaks on marginal lands. So our whiz-bang GIS guys have been working on this, trying to estimate the amount and distribution of lands that may be suitable for these kinds of uh, agroforestry practices. And then I have an estimate here of about 13,500 metric tons of carbon sequestration per year in the soil and biomass if uh, we planted one 50-foot wide windbreak per quarter section of this um, marginal land. So that's a big what if there. Uh, and of course, we're moving forward trying to refine what kind of estimates we could make for what the potential impact might be. So climate variability. We don't talk so much about climate change. Um, we try to focus on the variability and what the risks are. Climate's always changing. So it's the variability that really brings the risks and um, it's reducing those risks through adaptation practices and improving the resiliency of our cropping systems that are really the focus. Mitigation involves everybody working together, right? Mitigation, you know, one person sequestering carbon is not going to matter unless we all work together. So mitigation is the harder part of the, of the program. Adaptation is something an individual can do. Building resilience into their cropping system, that's something an individual can do. And so it's a lot easier for them to think about the benefits for themselves personally. And so the buy-in is a lot easier. We know we have to intensify land use. How to do that sustainable, sustainably is the challenge, right? Because we haven't done that great of a job of it in the past. And now we're going to ask more of our land, higher productivity, and improve the sustainability, that's obviously a big challenge. But I think the diversification, the perennials in the landscape, agroforestry has a lot to offer in terms of sustainable intensification. There are uh, excellent climate change adaptation and mitigation tools. We know that large part of each agroforestry practice is modifying the local microclimate. So it's already something that's familiar to us. It's something that we know how to manage. 
and for different areas, different systems, we do need more information about how to manage for future climates. Um, data from the Dust Bowl era, very interesting. Do we want to even plant the same trees now? Probably not, because the climates have changed. Um, and we learned a lot from what species uh, did well, how well they uh, self-propagated, because all those windbreaks were, were designed to perpetuate, to propagate themselves and keep the, the uh, windbreaks alive. And the regional climate hubs, um, their role in all of this, there's good partnership between ARS and Forest Service. So I think there's lots of opportunities for agroforestry there. And again, it's that assimilation of knowledge, trying to distill things down to useful information to the stakeholders, and taking information concerns from the stakeholders, moving them up to the researchers to address their uh, questions. With that, I think uh, I'll suspend my comments. And if there are some time for questions, we'll take those. Thank you. OK, thank you, Tom. Uh, can we have the lights up, please? We do have about 15 minutes. We have a slight uh, error in the program. So we're, we're going to go until 10.15 and then uh, break for our morning break. So we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers for uh, Tom. So uh, just raise your hand. And we'll try to repeat the question up here so that everyone can hear the question. And we'll try to make sure we hear the question, too. So anyone have questions for Tom? Covered it well. Yeah. Well, a comment and a question. Just thanks so much for providing the history of uh, windbreaks in the Great Plains. That was really interesting. I, I didn't know a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your the, the slide you showed um, showing where windbreaks still were is really impressive. I mean, that that eighty something years later, there mm -hmm. are still windbreaks, and I'm just wondering where you think that. Um, concept, like what, what would you do um, if you were able to, um, to understand more the, the, the persistence of windbreaks from that time? Yeah, question. yeah the, the question is, um, the windbreaks have persisted in certain areas. What can we do to sort of enhance that or increase the you know, presence of windbreaks? That's a uh, a nice example from Nebraska, but the irony is many parts of the Great Plains, the windbreaks have disappeared. They're not considered compatible with modern agriculture. They're in the way of large machinery. They're in the way of center pivots. There's center pivots, and I think even in that image, that probably resulted in windbreaks being removed. So um, even though there are places where they're definitely well established and ingrained, I think, there are many other places where uh, the current landowners and growers are like, they're just in the way. Uh, part of that could be related to the precipitation is increasing in the Great Plains. And so there are less, there is sort of a less per perception of less drought conditions. I'm thinking of especially the Dakotas. You know, they're growing corn west of the Missouri River now in the Dakotas. Well, that, was unthinkable in the Dust Bowl age. That would that was you know unthinkable that corn would be that far west, um, and so I think there's a real challenge. Another challenge is Roundup ready crops. Many trees are not Roundup resistant, so uh, there are lots of challenges out there. So you know I don't delude myself that even if we have really good information and evidence about the benefits, that it's going to still be an easy sell in places because of some of those sort of perceptions about um, their place in modern agriculture. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the climate curve, how they are organized? I see mostly the federal and state agencies, but how do you involve the private sector and universities to be part of this hub? Yeah, the question is, how do we involve universities and um, private sector in the climate hubs? Um, this is an evolving 
uh, process and it's it's trying to be coordinated at the federal level but really you know there's there are distinct regional differences but the ag experiment stations and extension are involved in in all of the hubs um, personally what I would like to see is I think we need a meeting we need a face-to-face -face for the climate hubs because a lot of this is done in conference calls webinars um, and we know the value of meeting face-to-face -face, right um, and part of it is also uh, what the vision is. The vision itself is still sort of an evolving thing. Um, there's some concern that uh, this is one of those initiatives that won't persist, that won't outlast the current administration. And so I think there's some hesitancy there, but you know, my feeling is um, if, we think, if we think that way, we're not gonna ever do anything. You know, This is an opportunity. If we embrace it, if we build it, if we prove its value, it's gonna persist. And that's my feeling, that we should just go for it. There's definitely a need. We don't need more New York Times editorials telling us <laughs> the trees are bad for climate change. People want accurate information that's relevant to their concerns. And I think the, the structure of the hub can do that. Yeah, I think it has to be a bottom up. You know, it has to involve uh, farmers, ranchers, landowners, you know, all stakeholders have to be on the table. It shouldn't be a top down, you know, because climate is affecting agricultural productivity, forestry, our daily life. So, how do we involve all the stakeholders? Yep, involving the stakeholders is key because, you know, there's not, you know, there, there is talk about um, initiatives about uh, adaptation and mitigation, but it's not involving new resources. It's redirecting current resources. So um, there's not gonna be a lot of new money. What that always means to me is that we need to use what we have more efficiently. And we need to give the stakeholders what they need. And that often doesn't happen with a top-down approach. We really need to listen to what they're concerned about, what they're willing to do on their land. One of our projects involved a large social science aspect and was very, very interesting. One of the major findings about growing trees for bioenergy is they wanted no subsidy because they felt the subsidy could be pulled at any time. It was a political thing. That what they wanted was a, a system that was economically feasible on its own that not, was not propped up by any government support, which I thought was a really interesting and refreshing kind of perspective. They just wanted to know, can I make money growing it on my own? Have, Thank you. Have you explored the energy credits uh, and energy credit <coughs> reserves as a way to fund uh, shelter milk? The question is, if I explored energy credits as a way to help fund shelter belt activities, um, we've, we have one individual who has been in discussion with us about that possibility. Yeah, um, you know, you have the new California initiative you mm -hmm. know, where, you know, if you're going to expand, you have to have credits, credits available for the future. You know, as governments get tight for money, it may become a route to get people, or at least give them an economic incentive. Yep. It, it is, uh, I think, definitely an era of increasing awareness and openness to these public-private kind of partnerships. And the individual that I spoke to, um, you know, he was throwing out a lot of corporations that uh, I thought would have absolutely no interest in agroforestry, but what they're looking for is a presence in a green, positive, uh, almost um, uh, public relations sort of perspective. They want to be seen as out there doing something good. Yeah, PG&E has, has done that in the West Coast. You know, they're looking at, you know, those, those things. Hmm. Need to keep moving here. Uh, Mike? There is some 
significant resistance to agroforestry in general in the plain state from wildlife uh, organizations. And to the point that one of the states that I work in, they put a position paper out against it. Mm -hmm. And some of those membranes were actually taken down, I don't know if it's in Nebraska, but in Minnesota, they've been taken down specifically for wildlife reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, there's resistance from um, uh, wildlife organizations, wildlife groups, to having trees in the Great Plains. Um, they, they need to read 1491. When the settlers and the explorers came to the Great Plains, they were treeless. And I've seen some of those early photos. There was nothing. Um, they assumed that that was natural. I think it's very unlikely that that was a natural landscape, that um, the Native Americans had managed that landscape to that level. Um, for instance, a very interesting article buried in the literature, you know, why do you think there's some place called Pine Ridge, South Dakota? Why are there trees in an area with so little rainfall? And this individual went through pollen records and such. And well, of course, they're native. They were naturally found there. Uh, they're not an anomaly. They were not planted by man. They were protected by topography from fire. And I think the, the um, conventional wisdom had been that fire was lightning, always natural uh, fires. Um, I don't believe that's really the case. So I think the the argument that you can make is that um, our perception of what natural or native vegetation is, is a snapshot in time and may not be a snapshot that's reflective of the native condition without man's impact. That's not going to go very well with wildlife groups. Um, but I think that's probably what the reality is. Got last time for one last question. We can go here for the seat here, and we'll come back to you. But go ahead. Um, I, mean, I appreciate you uh, bringing up the 1491 and sort of consideration of like other uh, other paradigms of land management that are pretty different from the sort of dominant one that we uh, are operating in today. And I want to I want to sort of question the sort of sustainable intensification being taken as a given. This seems to often just provide cover for uh, sort of business as usual and for the continued development of extremely in intensive agriculture with like minimal uh, acknowledgement that the environment exists mm -hmm. to protect on and sort of keeping us on the same trajectory and uh, with the justification that we need to feed 9 billion people and really sidelining the fact that we throw enough to feed 10 billion people right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is, you know, sustainable intensification and what does that mean? If it's just business as usual, um, relegating the environmental impacts to, to sort of the secondary uh, cost of doing business, cost of doing business. Um, yeah, that model's not going to work. Um, I don't know how that could work. I mean, we already know um, the sort of contamination that we've had, and you know, we've had a century of pretty intensive land use in, in the state of Iowa, for instance. Uh, if you work the numbers, we've lost uh, probably eight inches of topsoil in many places. Well, how much longer do you think we can keep that up? Um, farming subsoil is not nearly as productive. And people will say, well, my yields are going up. It's like, yes, well, you have unlimited inputs. If you were farming with 1945 techniques, an M farm all, early hybrid corn, very little commercial fertilizer, my guess is your yield today will be a lot lower than it was when grand, grandpa and grandma were farming it in 1945. The normal innate productivity of that soil is lost. It's being hidden by the fact that we have all these inputs available. Is there a short question, Jim? I would just a comment following up on your Pine Ridge thing. There is an article out of Kansas State that lists a number of those topographical sites 
all the way from southern Canada, all the way down into Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the author is Wells, but I, I wouldn't say. Okay. But that's not the only example of that topographic protection. Yep. Thank you. Okay. With that, just give uh, Tom a hand.